It was first discovered by the soldiers of Napoleon, and it was the origin of Egyptology. And the ancient Egypt was wiped out by the ancient Roman Empire. And the modern Egyptians are not ancient Egyptians. The modern Egyptians believe in Islam, so they cannot read the pictograph on the Rosetta Stone. And here you can see the base tomb inscription with cuneiforms of the Sumerians. They look like the footprints of sparrows. You know, the ancient Babylon also wiped out, and the modern Iraqis are Arabians, not Babylonians. And you know, in ancient India, the modern Indians are also not the ancient Indians. They are the Aryans, actually the descendants of invaders. But we Chinese people can read the ancient classics written 3,000 years ago. That's amazing. Here you can see the clerical, the official script written on the bamboo slips. This is the analects of Confucius. So we can learn the first two sentences written on it, saying Confucius said, to learn and to practice what is learned time and, time and again is pleasure. To have friends coming from afar is happiness, isn't it? So, when you go upstairs to the Confucius Institute, so you will see the couplet here, to learn and to practice what is learned time and again is pleasure, isn't it? So isn't it amazing? Okay. Now, in the long course of historical development, Chinese people have created a treasure house of traditional culture. And I bet you can enumerate a host of Chinese elements. So here we can see the Note, the Chinese note, and the China literally translated as the Middle Kingdom. And here the bamboo slips, and this is the Nine Dragon War, and the Great War. These are the ruins of ancient stone sculptures, and Chinese calligraphy, and here the pictograph inscribed on the Tortoise shells and beast bones. So actually, the inscriptions were carved on the tortoise belly or the abdomen because the turtle back is too hard to carve. Okay, so so many Chinese elements, and we will also learn the three main ideological streams of China. So the three main ideological streams of China are Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. So here you can see the portrait of Confucius and the statue of Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu is the supreme patriarch of Taoism. So Taoism is the only native or indigenous religion of China. And Sakyamuni, the founder of Buddhism. So Chinese people are very tolerant as to religion. In some places, the statues of Confucius, Lao Tzu, and Sakyamuni are enshrined together, side by side. In many famous meetings are the holy places for both Buddhism and Taoism. So that's just amazing, very tolerant. And here you can see the Tai Chi diagram and the eight trigrams. You know, in the north, here in ancient China, the top is the north, uh, is, is the south. In the south is the heaven. 
and in the north is the earth. So the heaven is the father, the north is the mother. The heaven mated with the earth and giving birth to all the elements, all the substances in the universe. So here you can see their daughters and sons. This is the lake, the youngest daughter. And the fire, the second daughter. The thunder, the eldest son. And the wind, the eldest daughter. The water, the second son. And the mountain, the youngest son. And have you seen here? The broken line is the symbol of yin, or we say negative. And the unbroken line is the symbol of yang, that's positive. And here you can see the national flag of South Korea. The South Korea. Here you can see four trigrams, the heaven, the earth, the water, and the fire. So heaven and earth in harmony, water and fire coordinating. So that's part of the reason why the economy of South Korea developed so quickly after the Second World War. Okay. The next week we will work on the Ichi, the Book of Changes, next Friday. Okay. And. Many foreigners would like to buy products, typically Chinese. And what are indeed the products, typically Chinese? Three types, tea, silk, and porcelain. You know, tea in China falls into, we have green tea, black tea, oolong tea, and white tea yellow tea and the compact tea yeah or say <laughs> and the silk the silk was greedy and the silk road and the porcelain you know porcelain and china see in small letter so the country and the porcelain share the same English word. So the porcelain is the calling card of China. And we will also learn the four national pits, the four national pits of China, such as the Beijing Opera. You know the painted facial patterns of Beijing Opera, almost becoming the emblem of Chinese culture. And ink painting, Chinese ink painting, ink and wash, really unique. Using the right writing brush and the ink to draw on a snow white shell paper. So really unique. Sometimes on the piece of paper, only three cucumbers or two chickens on the corner and the rest is blank. So uh, really unique. And Chinese martial arts. We have martial arts, martial ethics, and martial artistry. And Chinese medicine. Chinese medicine. The four methods of diagnosis. The diagnosis. The four methods of diagnosis based on an observational system. Feeling the patient's pulse. And we have, we also have got the Moxibustion, acupuncture, and massage. So we have got the four national pits. And the other cultural aspects, like the Chinese cuisine, one of the greatest cuisines in the world, together with French cuisine and Turkish cuisine. And the traditional Chinese festivals and the costumes. You know the spring festival? The spring festival is at the lantern festival, and we have also the dragon boat festival, mid autumn festival, double nines, double sevens festival, and the pure 
evil, brightness, etc. And the major religions in China, say Buddhism and the native or indigenous religion is Taoism. And Confucianism is actually not a religion, an ideological stream. And arts and crafts diversified. The Chinese calligraphy, seal cutting, ancient architecture, and classical gardens. So we have a series, serial cultural lectures. Okay. And now here comes the question: How to appreciate the traditional Chinese culture? What is the open sesame, or what is the key to this treasure house of traditional Chinese culture? If you are expected to choose two words to summarize the open sesame, the key of Chinese culture, what are the two words? To my understanding, symbolism. And uh, harmony. So harmony and symbolism, the two words. So remember, keep in mind harmony and symbolism. It was Zhang Fei of the Song Dynasty who first put forward the theory of a complete harmony between man and nature. So remember, complete harmony between man and nature. And I will give you. Some examples to illustrate the harmony and the symbolism. In the examples, we will frequently come across the two words: harmony and symbolism, and a complete harmony between man and nature. Okay, shall we begin with bronzeware? So, you know, I have visited the Mimura Museum. <laughs> The Mimura Museum last uh, last month, and I was deeply impressed by the glassware on show in the first floor. Really beautiful and exquisitely blue. And in Shanghai Museum, also in the first floor, there is the bronzeware gallery. So if you visit Shanghai, it is a must for you to visit the. Bronzeware Gallery in Shanghai Museum, and the bronzeware is the test testimony of the Bronze Age in Chinese history. We have the Stone Tool Age. After the Stone Tool, bronzeware, and then the Iron Tool Age. So the Bronze Age began about four thousand years ago. And it lasted for 1,500 years. So the Bronze Ware was the testimony, testimony to the Bronze Age. And the Bronze Ware articles were mainly used as the utensils, vessels, or instruments, and mainly used in sacrificial ceremonies. In sacrificial ceremonies to worship the heaven. And Earth, so embodying the complete harmony between man and nature. Now comes the question: How to appreciate Chinese bronzeware? We can appreciate Chinese bronzeware from five aspects. First, the magnificent shapes. Most bronze articles were used as the best. Vessels to store wine or to drink wine. You know, at that time, people were fond of drinking, so many articles were used to store wine or to drink wine, and some were used to cook food or to store food, and the others were used as musical instruments, weapons, or daily necessities. So, first, the magnificent shape. And next, the exquisite motifs, including the animal mask pattern, most mostly animal mask pattern, sometimes dragon and a phoenix pattern, 
dragon and a cloud pattern, geometric pattern, thunder and a lightning pattern, crisscross pattern, etc. So, the exquisite motifs and the delicately inscribed scripts, the inscription. Descriptions are very precious, actually less than 10,000 characters, so not many, very precious. And the profound historical information. Usually there is a story behind each piece of bronzeware. And advanced casting techniques, most commonly the clay mold method outer clay mold, inner clay mold, and lost wax method, and separate casting, etc. Okay, now shall we try to appreciate some of the bronze articles from Shanghai Museum. Here you can see this vessel is called Zun. Now guess what is it used for? store wine. It is used to store wine. And here you can see it is square. And on the shoulders there are four corners. On each corner there is a vertical animal. So cast by separate casting. So the body and the ornaments were cast separately. And then they were welded together. So separate casting indicating that at that time the casting techniques was at a very high level. And you can also find the inscription. And here you can see the rubbing of the inscription. So we know that the story behind it, we know the name of this Zun. This is called Zun. And this is called Gui. Guess what is it used for? Food, yeah, to contain and to steam food. So here you can see in the bottom it is square, and there's a lid. The lid, we can see the designs on the lid. The lid can be put upside down. When it is put upside down, it can be used as a container. So this is used to contain food and to steam food. And this bronze ware, we call it, with a handle, we call it yo. So it is also used to, to store wine, to store wine. So it is different from the other bronze ware, in that it is tube shaped. And on it, you can see a cow head, the protruding cow head was here, two ears stretching out and the two eyes shining. So this is used to store wine. And guess what this is used for? This is the jia. So what is it used for? To drink wine. So to drink wine. And here I'd like to call your attention to this pattern. This is the animal mask pattern. Animal mask pattern is frequently used to decorate bronze ware. So this animal is called Tao Tie. And the Tao Tie is a very greedy animal. It only has a head with no body. It is so greedy that it has even eaten its own body. So it has only a head and with an extremely large mouth. So this is the animal mask pet used to drink wine. And this is called yi. It is used to wash hands. And on this bottom, there are some inscriptions telling the marriage between the nobles at that time. So very precious. And this is, can be, and it can be used as a basin to wash hands and can also be used as a plate to contain water. And this is the di. With three legs, we call it tripod. If the di has four legs, we call it quadripod. So we have a tripod and a quadripod. This is very big. And the di is used to cook meat. Actually, most of 
that were used in sacrificial ceremonies, sacrificial vessels. And Ding is also the symbol of social status. According to the regulation of the Zhou Dynasty, the king can have nine Dings, and the dukes can have seven Dings. And for the ministers, five. And the ordinary officials can only have three. So that's a symbol of social status. And this is called Da Ke Tripod. Da Ke Di, Da Ke Tripod. It is very large and heavy. The most fantastic about this Di is that <coughs> there are 290 characters, inscriptions inscribed on it, so very precious, telling about the meritorious deeds of aristocrat Ke's ancestors. So these inscriptions are very precious. And this is a set of bells, recorded chimes. These are musical instrument, yeah, musical instrument. Here you can see 14 and actually there are two others unearthed, so all together 16. These are the musical instruments, the chimes, and also the weapons, weapons with crisscross pattern, here the crisscross pattern. And this is the transparent mirror. This mirror is magic. So if you let light shine on the mirror, the design on the back of the mirror can be seen just through the mirror. So really magic. Now here I'd like to recommend this bronze web. It is called Xi Zun. It is also a wine vessel cast in the late spring and autumn period. Now we can see that it is in the shape of a buffalo. And on the back of the buffalo there are three holes. And the lids are missing with no cover. So please guess what is it used for? It is a wine vessel. So it, it is used to store wine. So entry, the hole in the middle is a port used to store wine. And the two holes on both sides are used to contain hot water in order to heat the wine. So this is a wine warmer used to heat the wine. So very ingeniously designed. And have you noticed that there is a ring in the nose of the buffalo? So why? To, to control it, to tame it. So this is very precious in scientific research. It indicated that at that time people already knew how to domesticate, how to tame the buffalo. If you want to tame the buffalo, you want to control it, you must uh, hold its nose. You must hold its nose. Now let's come to Chinese cuisine. So Chinese cuisine is one of the great cuisines in the world. <laughs> and it is also one of the pleasures the foreigners can enjoy in China. And how to appreciate Chinese cuisine? Usually from three aspects. The color, aroma or spell, and the taste or flavor. And we can also appreciate Chinese cuisine from the shape or appearance. You know the cutting techniques. The ingredients of a dish can be cut into, say, slices, shreds, or sections, dices, cubes, grains, even minced. And some of the Chinese characters are also carved into the food or vegetables, like the happiness, longevity, fortune, wealth, etc. And uh, some, uh, some, something like the radish or potatoes can
can be carved into designs of birds or animals. And the container, the utensil, for example, the porcelain, the blue and white porcelain, familiar walls, overglazed, underglazed, salad and wear, etc. And sometimes even the sound. For example, there's a dish called sliced beef with onion on an eye pan. So the sliced beef is sizzling. So it's sizzling, hissing hot. So you can enjoy the sound. And the symbolic meaning. It's profound cultural insight. Shall we take the Confucius family banquet, for example? In Confucius family banquet, there's a dish called jadeite shark fin. The jadeite shark fin is symbolic of wealth. And another dish, shrimps wearing jade belt. You know jade belt? Shrimps wearing jade belt. This dish is symbolic of nobility, jade belts. And there's a famous dish called Eight Immortals Crossing the Sea and Playing with Art. This dish is, sim is symbolic of longevity. So, do you know the story about the Eight Immortals Crossing the Sea? This is very famous. The Eight Immortals in Taoism. So, Eight Immortals Crossing the Seas simplify the longevity in Taoism. You know, Taoism is the indigenous religion of China, the native religion of China. And in this dish, the eight immortals are actually the eight ingredients of this dish. Now let's see the eight ingredients. This is asparagus. So asparagus, shrimps, shark's fin, sea cucumber, fish maw, fish bone, ham, and abalone. So the eight immortals crossing the sea. And a player with art. In the middle is the chicken. And the chicken indicating the art. Art in Buddhism, the Buddhist saint. So in Buddhism, we have Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and arts. So we have the Taoism and the Buddhism. And this dish is the first dish in Confucius family banquet. You know the Confucius family banquet, this is the very first dish. So here you can see that Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism coexist in this dish. So also uh, coexist, coexist harmoniously in China. Now I'd like to tell you a story about the poetic dishes. So, in the ancient times, there was a scholar, a very poor scholar. He was so poor that he had only 10 corners in his pocket. <laughs> However, his friends would come to visit him and it would be his treat. And he felt somewhat frustrated. And then he had an idea. He gave the ten corners to his wife and asked her to buy some bean curd. Some bean curd? Two eggs and some shallots, you know, the shallots or the scallion. And asked her to prepare four dishes. So when his distinguished guests came, the first dish was put on the table. On the porcelain plate are some shallots, you know, green shallots, and two egg yellows, egg yellows, or with a yolks. And the scholar said the name of the dish is two golden Oreos sing amid willows green. It's a beautiful name. And the second dish is a line of egg white, no, egg white, a line of egg white. And the scholar said the name of the dish is a row of white egrets flies into the blue sky. So a 
beautiful name. And the third dish, uh, some bean curd, just some bean curd. And the name of the dish, my window frames the, the snow-capped western hill. The snow-capped western hill, or the snow-capped, the snow-crowned western hill. And what is most amazing is the last dish. The last dish is a soup. So, under boiling water, some eggshells, some eggshells are floating. And the name of the dish, beyond the door, lie the east-going ships. So, really poetic dishes. And actually, this is a famous poem written by the Tang Dynasty poet, Du Fu. Do you know Du Fu? Okay, this is a poem written by Du Fu. So, really poetic dishes. Now, how to appreciate Chinese painting, ink and wash, Chinese ink painting? There are four arts or four essentials, say poetry, calligraphy, painting, and seal engraving. So make it a rule to put them in the correct order. The correct order should be first poetry, next calligraphy, painting, and seal engraving. So in ancient Chinese, most artists are both poets and calligraphers. And painting in poetry and poetry in painting are one of the criteria of excellent works of art. So poetry and calligraphy. And painting. The seal engraving, the seal engraving, inscriptions, inscription and seal steps were used to express the lofty ideals, the ideas and the sentiments of the author, of the artist. And also they add decorative beauty to the painting. Now shall we try to appreciate this painting, Spring Outing. And this is the first landscape painting actually in the world. Okay. Painted by Zhang Ziqian in the 7th century, so in the Sui Dynasty. It was ex ex excavated in China, while in the West, landscape painting started from Great Britain in the 16th century. So, landscape painting was well developed in China. So here you, you can appreciate from four aspects. What are the four aspects? So, poetry, calligraphy, painting, and seal engraving. Seal engraving. So, this is the landscape painting. So, at the top notch place, in Confucianism and Taoism, there are three grades. The three grades are heaven, earth, and man. Heaven and earth and man are the three grades. And in this picture, we can see the heavens with the green plantation and the earth, the river, and the horses. So where are human beings? Yeah, here, in the wild. So man is a grain in the vast sea. It's expressing a complete harmony between man and nature. So landscaping, uh, landscape painting was well developed in China, especially in the Song and the Yuan dynasties. While in the West, in ancient Greek philosophy, man was the master of all beings of the universe, the most beautiful and essential part of the world are human beings, human figures, the naked or some nude sculptures like David, and in the West, as uh, we can see in the Memorial Museum, the figure painting was very well developed. So the landscape only served as the background to make out the human figure. The landscape is of minor importance. 
And here, I'd like to call your attention to the shifting perspective. Can you find a focus in this painting? No focal point. So the Chinese artists adopt the shifting perspective. The shifting perspective enables them to express what he wants instead of what he sees, what he wants. So they can express both the things which are far and the things which are near. So they can break away from the limitation of time and space. So they neglect the proportion, perspective, and light. So break away from the restriction of proportion, perspective, and light, expressing what they want. And they also put forward the theory like uh, a painting should be something between likeness and unlikeness. The likeness in spirit resides in unlikeness. So they put, put forward such kind of theory. So all in all, the Chinese graphic art largely depends on lines and brush strokes. Lines and brush strokes. However, the Western paintings as in the third floor of the Memorial Museum, usually there is a definite period of time and then there is a focal point, a definite scene, and a distinctive subject. And the Western paintings, um, the oil paintings on the canvas, is usually created by light and color. So that's the difference. Now shall we come to the characteristics of Chinese buildings. To the visitors to China, <coughs> sightseeing means the daily encounter with the Chinese architecture of one kind or another. So the temples, pagodas, mausoleums, residential houses, and what indeed are the characteristics of Chinese buildings? There are six aspects. First of all is the north-south central axis. This is the cardinal characteristic, the central axis. And the timber structure, the widely use of wood, of timber. You know the tenon, the tenon is the square block. And the mortise is the square hole. By inserting the tenon into the mortise, the whole building can be constructed without the use of a single nail, also without the use of glue. So extensive use of timber. While in the West, uh, usually stone, stone structure. And the massive and the curved roof, Chinese roofs are usually very large and massive. And the terrace structure, the terrace structure, the platform, and the arm-shaped cobble construction, I will explain the cobble construction later. And the decorations, the colorful painting and the decorative sculpture, really detailed. Now shall we begin with the north-south central axis. Have you been to the Forbidden City? Yes. In the Forbidden City, there are the three great halls of harmony. The Hall of Supreme Harmony, the Hall of Central Harmony, and the Hall of Preserving Harmony. They stand in the central axis, the central, north-south central axis, well-spaced symbolizing the supreme authority the emperors enjoyed in the feudalistic societies, while clustered around these red buildings are some smaller buildings where the eunuchs, the eunuchs, the male servant, yeah, the so-called male, the male servant and the concubines, concubines were locked in battle for authority and influence. And the residential part of the imperial family usually are found in the back of the Forbidden City. 
So there's the central axis. And the timber structure. The wide, the wide or extensive use of timber. Now, timber is used together with brick and tile. The timber is not only easily available and transportable, they are also very practical and quick resistant, so quick proof, the timber structure. However, timber structure, the wood, wooden structures, are not so easily preserved. So they are easily damaged by fire or by war. While in the West, the stone sculptures are usually well preserved. For example, many of you would like to visit the Acropolis, the Acropolis in Athens. You would like to visit the Temple of Parthenon or the Temple of Athena Nike or the Erechtheum with the columns of the goddess figures. And some of you would like to visit Rome, the Colosseum or the Pantheon in Rome. Actually, in Pula, there is also a Colosseum built in the first century and still very well preserved. So just amazing in the first century. But in China, uh, the wooden structures are not so easily preserved, mostly damaged. Okay. And the massive and the curved roof. The Chinese buildings usually have very large and big roofs and also slightly upturned. And the practical value of the massive and curved roof, first of all, is to ensure enough light. To ensure enough light while carrying off rainwater easily. And it has also aesthetic value it can give the building an air of weightlessness, usually the large building. So give the large building an air of weightlessness and to achieve an illusion of floating, as in floating in a cloud. And the roofs of palaces were usually decorated with glazed tiles, the yellow glazed tiles. <laughs> so the massive and curved roof. Sometimes, when you are standing in front of an ancient building, you may wonder, when was it constructed? In which dynasty? Sometimes you can make that judgment just according to the roofs. If the roof you see are gentle and elegant like this, so guess in which dynasty? maybe built in the Tang Dynasty. And if you see the roof are uh, slightly upturned like this, which dynasty? Slightly upturned. Song Dynasty. And if you see that the roofs are high rising, high rising like this, which dynasty? Ming and Qi. Dynasties. So the tendency is becoming more and more upturned. Okay. Now next, the terrace structure, the platform. You know the wooden structure has to be protected from any ingress of water. So usually Chinese buildings rise from a terrace. And it has also aesthetic value. And the old text points to a symbolic and cosmological meaning. The heaven covers and the earth carries. And here we come to the recurrent theme of a complete harmony between man and nature. So the heaven symbolizing, the roof symbolizing the heaven, and the terrace symbolizing the earth. So here you can see the terrace, the stone carving on the terrace behind the hall of preserving harmony. 
Uh, next, the cobble structure, very unique. The cobble structures are usually under the eaves and are very exquisitely designed. It is the ultimate form of or style of Chinese architecture. You can see that it is incredibly complex and visually intriguing. It is composed of a square block here, a square block, and then the arm-shaped long wood. So the arm-shaped long wood and the block. So it is also a symbol of social status. Ordinary people were not allowed to own the cobble structure. So they were the prerogative of people of rank. Usually behind, under, under the eaves for decoration and also to support the roof. And the colorful painting and the decorative sculptures, very detailed and exquisite. The colorful paintings has, have the protective, decorative and symbolic functions. The protective, to protect from what? From worms, insects, the aggression of water or protect from erosion. If you visit the summer palace in Beijing, the long corridor is famous for the colorful paintings, the long corridor. And the decorative sculptures, there are a variety of decorative sculptures, say the brick carving, the stone carving, clay figurines, and sometimes you can see on the roof ridges, there are some mythological beasts. And in front of mausoleums, there are men and the beasts in front of the mausoleum, the sacred paths in front of the mausoleums. So these are very exquisite. Now here I have drawn a sketch of a typical Chinese building. So the roof is the symbol of heaven. And the terrace is the symbol of earth. So heaven, earth, and men are the three grades. So the heaven covers and the earth carries. So we have come to the recurrent theme of the complete harmony between man and nature. Now this is a very precious building. As I have just mentioned, the wooden structures are not so easy, not easily preserved. And this is a genuine building, preserved in the Tang Dynasty. So it is located in Mount Wutai. This is the Nanchang Temple in Mount Wutai. Mount Wutai is located in Shanxi province. It is a Buddhist mountain. It is the preaching place of Bodhisattva of great wisdom in China. In this picture, we can see the characteristics of the architectural style of the Tang Dynasty. So this is a genuine building left over by, by the Tang Dynasty. So very precious. Now we can see the features of the buildings of the Tang Dynasty. First, the eaves. Just I have mentioned. What about the eaves, the roofs of the Tang Dynasty building? Very gentle, slight slope, so elegant and graceful. So this is the gentle and a slight slope. And you, you can see that the roof stretching out very deep. So the stretching out, so this is the deep eaves and the big cobbles. In the Tang Dynasty, usually there are big cobbles. Remember the cobble structure? Big cobbles under the eaves. And this is the terrace. Here you can see the thick pillars, the thick pillars, wooden doors, and straight window lattice, straight window lattice. So these are the features of the buildings of the Tang Dynasty. And you can also see that this is the terrace, the earth carries, this is the roof, the heaven, the heaven covers and a complete harmony between man and nature. The heaven, the earth, and the man. In 
Japan, you can see many such kind of buildings. Because in the Tang Dynasty, the capital is Chang'an. Chang'an is very striving and prosperous. And in Chang'an, there were many Japanese students learning Chinese language and Chinese culture. So here you can see the features of the Tang Dynasty architectural style. Now here you can see three halls look, looking similar. These three buildings are all located in Songshan Mountain. Songshan Mountain in Henan province, which is the center, the central plain, the center of China. And this is Zhongyue Temple. This is called the Zhongyue Temple. It is a Taoist temple. A Taoist temple in Songshan Mountain. Zhongyue Temple. And this is a Shaolin Monastery. Have you heard of Shaolin Monastery? It is famous for its martial arts. Martial arts. And it is also the birthplace of the Zen Buddhism. The Zen Buddhism for meditation. And it is also a Buddhist temple, so this is Shaolin Monastery. And this is Song, a Songyang Academy. So Songyang Academy of Confucianism. So in the same mountain, we have Taoism, Buddhism, and Confucianism. So in the same mountain in central China, so coexist so harmoniously. And have you noticed that these buildings are all taking root firmly into the earth. They are not very high. The, the eaves usually the blunt angle. So steady and sedate and composed. Also simplifying uh, the spirit or the personalities of the oriental people. And can you tell me the name of this building? This is the cathedral for the Assumption of the Holy Virgin, or we say St. Stephen's Cathedral in Zagreb. You can see that it, soar, it is soaring high into the sky in Gothic style, where there is the gold. So, soaring high to the sky, penetrating and enterprising, so signifying these kind of spirits. So totally different. We can see the acute angle. The acute angle. So here we can see the differences between the structures of the eastern buildings and the western buildings. So here I have drawn the sketch. The oriental like the pyramid, the occidental structures like the Eiffel Tower. So stable and peaceful while here enterprising and progressive. And also the houses, the blunt angle steady and sedate, and the acute angle dashing upwards, penetrating and vigorous. Here you can see the, what? The, yeah, in Beijing Opera, the painted facial patterns. The painted facial patterns have almost become the emblem of Chinese culture. So many foreign countries have used the painted facial patterns in their when they are designing the flyers or designing the posters. So to include the painted facial pattern to indicate a year of Chinese culture. The painted facial patterns are applied in Beijing Opera in two roles: the male character and the clown. The male character and the clown to indicate different personalities, the different personalities by using different colors. So they are used to indicate the age, profession, or personality. So each color symbolizes a different personality. For example, here you can see the red. So a red face indicating that the person is loyal and brave, so symbolizing valor and bravery. For example, Guan Yu. Do you know Guan Yu in the novel of the Three Kingdoms? The Romans of the Three Kingdoms. The classic novel. 
So he's a historical figure in the Romans of three kingdoms. He's very loyal and brave. So he has got a red face. And the black face, black face indicating that the person is upright and straightforward, maybe somewhat rude. So here you can see Zhang Fei, also a historical figure in the Romans of Three Kingdoms. He's very upright and also some, sometimes rude. Here you can see that the painted facial patterns of Zhang Fei has the shape of a butterfly. So really artistically designed, a masterpiece. And pay attention, these are not masks different from masks, painted directly on the face, so not masks. And a white face, for example, Cao Cao, also in the Romans of the Three Kingdoms, indicating that the person is cunning and deceitful, was somewhat evil. So there are over 1,000 painted facial patterns in Beijing Opera. Each indicate a different, each design is, uh, each pattern is designed for a particular historical figure and it can never be used for another. So just like the fingerprints can never be used for another. So we have come across symbolism. Symbolism is essential in Beijing opera. You know, acting is not subjected to time and space in Beijing opera. Here also symbolism works. You know that some activities in everyday life cannot be possibly reproduced on stage. And Beijing opera gives expression to them in a symbolic order, in a symbolic way. Thus, particular Bodily movements, particular bodily movements, movements signifying opening a door, entering or leaving a room, going upstairs or down, or climbing a mountain or wading across a river. Sometimes you can see on the stage a performer say whip in hand and circling on the stage, maybe symbolizing riding a horse, whip in hand. And a walk in a circle indicating a long journey. And two persons somersaulting under the spotlight indicating that they are how they are groping and fighting in the dark. And sometimes four soldiers, four generals flanking both sides of the stage signifying an army several thousand strong. And a performer holding an oar or paddle and a doing knee bend, signifying tra traveling in a boat. So here we can see an example. This is a play called Autumn River. And the play depicting a young nun, this is a young nun, who leaves the nunnery to pursue her lover. To pursue her lover. And she has to cross a river. And on the stage, there is neither water nor river. And from the performance of the young girl, of the young girl and the old boatman, the audience can ob obviously see that the stage is a river. And all the time, the girl complained that the boat is too slow. The boat you know, swayed upwards and backwards and the girl complained that the boat is too slow and the old boatman keeps teasing her, making fun of her about her anxiety to see her lover. So the play is full of wit and humor. So really exciting. Now, here you can see the topics of the serial lectures on Chinese culture. Uh, this is the first lecture, Harmony and the Symbolism, and we also have the classic of changes, the Yi Ching, 
and the poetic symbols of Chinese characters and the flying strokes of calligraphy. And Tai Chi, drawing the elegant circles of life. So they are subject to change, so temporary arrangement. And the bronze wear, Chinese tea, costume, culinary art, Beijing <laughs> opera, Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, and porcelain, silk, folk arts, festivals, ink painting, Chinese medicine, architecture, and classical gardens. Okay, so much for the Havala. Ako imate kakvih pitanja koje u slučaju nešto vezano uz ovo, kao što je vidite, Sovica Vagija najavila i tih 20 zapravo predavanja ovog leta, pa znam ovo uvodno predavanje u tih 20 zutarnih predavanja koje će se odigravati ovdje, pa ako imate kakvih možda pitanja za preko Sovice Vagija vezano uz ovo što ste danas čuli. Usually just uh, giving the lectures, uh, except the Tai Chi, maybe we yeah. have the chance to practice some forms. Okay. Please don't forget that we also have uh, calligraphy lessons and soon we will have also the Chinese painting lessons. We have the Tai Chi and the Chi will go with the Chinese language and we will bring more programs starting with Chinese cooking and, and other programs. So what you are talking about, the practical part, it will be in separate, separate lessons from here. This is just the cultural part of the lessons itself, but the practical part can be done by the programs of this. Any more questions, maybe for Professor Wang? Then I would like to help thank Professor Wang. It's my pleasure. And I hope you will be able to enjoy it, and I hope you will be able to enjoy it doći i drugi put na web od predavanja koje ćemo isto tako najaviti kroz naše ili našu mailing listu na koju se možete prijatiti na našoj web stranici ili možete zatražiti nas mailom, povištavamo o tome ili možete na našem Facebooku i na našem stranici potražiti samo informaciju o predavanju i ovom programu. Ja se mislim da hvala vam još jednom i želim vam puno večer. Damo na sretan dan žena u svakom slučaju i puno vam biti ovdje. Pa ne bi se mi bi se